Act Two, Scene One of The Taming of the Shrew. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Taming of the Shrew by William Shakespeare. Act Two, Scene One. Petruchio, read by Algy Pug. Katharina, read by Verity Kendall. I will attend her here, and woo her with some spirit when she comes. Say that she rail, while then I'll tell her plain she sings as sweetly as a nightingale. Say that she frown, I'll say she looks as clear as morning roses newly washed with dew. Say she be mute and will not speak a word, then I'll commend her volubility, and say she uttereth piercing eloquence. If she do bid me pack, I'll give her thanks, as though she bid me stay by her a week. If she deny to wed, I'll crave the day when I shall ask the bands, and when be married. But here she comes, and now, Petruchio, speak. Enter Katharina. Good morrow, Kate, for that's your name, I hear. Well have you heard, but something hard of hearing. They call me Katharina that do speak of me. You lie in faith, for you are called plain Kate, and bonny Kate, and sometimes Kate the cursed. But Kate, the prettiest Kate in Christendom, Kate of Kate Hall, my super dainty Kate, for dainties are all Kates, and therefore Kate, take this of me, Kate, of my consolation. Hearing thy mildness praised in every town, thy virtues spoke of, and thy beauty sounded, yet not so deeply as to thee belongs, myself have moved to woo thee for my wife. Moved? In good time. Let him that moved you hither remove you hence. I knew you at first, you were a movable. Why, what's a movable? A joined stool. Thou hast hit it. Come, sit on me. Asses are made to bear, and so are you. Women are made to bear, and so are you. No such a jade as you, if me you mean. Alas, good Kate, I will not burden thee, for knowing thee to be but young and light. Too light for such a swain as you to catch, and yet as heavy as my weight should be. Should be, should buzz. Well tame and like a buzzard. O oh, slow-winged turtle, shall a buzzard take thee? Ay, for a turtle as he takes a buzzard. <laughs> come, come, you wasp, ye faith you are too angry. If I be waspish, best beware my sting. My remedy is then to pluck it out. Ay, if the fool could find it where it lies. Who knows not where a wasp does where his sting? In his tail. In his tongue. Whose tongue? yours if you'll talk of tales and so farewell what with my tongue in your tail nay come again good kate i am a gentleman <coughs> that i'll try she strikes him i swear i'll cuff you if you strike again so may you lose your arms if you strike me you are no gentleman and if no gentleman why then no arms a herald kate oh put me in thy books what is your crest? A cock's comb? A combless cock, so Kate will be my hen. No cock of mine, you crow to like a craven. Nay, come, Kate, come, you must not look so sour. It is my fashion when I see a crab. Why, he is no crab, and therefore look not sour. There is, there is. Then show it me. Had I a glass, I would. What, you mean my face? Well aimed of such a young one. Now, by St. George, I am too young for you. <laughs> Yet you are withered. Tis with cares. I care not. Nay, hear you, Kate. In sooth, you escape not so. I chafe you if I tarry. Let me go. No, not a whit. I find you passing gentle. Twas told me you were rough and coy and sullen, and now I find report a very liar. For thou art pleasant, gamesome, passing, courteous, but slow in speech, yet sweet as springtime flowers. Thou canst not frown, thou canst not look askance, nor bite the lip as angry wenches will, nor hast thou pleasure to be cross in talk, but thou with mildness entertainst thy wooers, with gentle conference soft and affable. Why does the world report that Kate doth limp? O oh, slanderous world! Kate, like the hazel twig, is straight and slender, and as brown in hue as hazelnuts, and sweeter than the kernels. Oh, let me see thee walk, thou dost not halt. Go, fool, and who thou keep'st to command. Did ever Diane so become a grove as Kate this chamber with her princely gait? 
oh be thou diane and let her be kate and then let kate be chaste and diane sportful where did you study all this goodly speech it is extempore from my mother wit a witty mother witless else her son am i not wise yes keep you warm marry so i mean sweet katharina in thy bed and therefore setting all this chat aside thus in plain terms your father hath consented that you shall be my wife your dowry greed on and will you nil you i will marry you now kate i am a husband for your turn for by this light whereby i see thy beauty thy beauty that doth make me like thee well thou must be married to no man but me for i am he am born to tame you kate and bring you from a wild kate to a kate conformable as other household kates here comes your father never make denial i must and will have katharina to my wife end of the taming of the shrew act two scene one Act One, Scene Two of Richard the Third. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Richard the Third, by William Shakespeare, Act One, Scene Two. Lady Anne, read by Elizabeth Barr. Gloucester, read by Winston Tharp. Enter the corpse of King Henry the Sixth, gentlemen with halberds to guard it, Lady Anne being the mourner. Set down, set down your honourable load, if honour may be shrouded in a hearse, whilst I awhile obsequiously lament the untimely fall of virtuous Lancaster, poor key cold figure of a holy king, pale ashes of the house of Lancaster, thou bloodless remnant of that royal blood. Be it lawful that I invocate thy ghost to hear the lamentations of poor Anne. Wife to thy Edward, to thy slaughtered son, stabbed by the selfsame hand that made these wounds. Lo, in these windows that let forth thy life, I pour the helpless balm of my poor eyes. Curse be the hand that made these fatal holes. Curse be the heart that had the heart to do it curse the blood that let this blood from hence more direful appetite that hated wretch that makes us wretched by the death of thee than i can wish to adders spiders toads or any creeping venomed thing that lives if ever he have child abortive be it prodigious and untimely brought to light whose ugly and unnatural aspect may fright the hopeful mother at the view and that be heir to his unhappiness if ever he have wife, let her he made a miserable but by the death of him, as I am made by my poor lord and thee. Come, now towards Chertsey with your holy load, taken from Paul's to be interred there, and still as you are weary of the weight, rest you, whilst I lament King Henry's course. Enter Gloucester. Stay, you that bear the course, and set it down. What black magician conjures up this fiend to stop devoted charitable deeds? Villain, set down the course of a St. Paul, I'll make a course of him that disobeys. My lord, stand back, and let the coffin pass. Unmanned dog, stand thou when I command. Advance thy halbert higher than my breast, or by St. Paul I'll strike thee to my foot, and spurn upon thee, beggar, for thy boldness. What, do you tremble? Are you all afraid? Alas, I blame you not, for you are mortal, and mortal eyes cannot endure the devil. Avaunt, thou dreadful minister of hell! Thou hadst but power over his mortal body, his soul thou canst not have, therefore be gone. Sweet saint, for charity, be not so cursed. Foul devil, for God's sake, hence, and trouble us not. For thou hast made the happy earth thy hell, filled it with cursing cries and deep exclaims. If thou delight to view thy heinous deeds, behold this pattern of thy butcheries. O oh, gentlemen, see, see, dead Henry's wounds open their congealed mouths and bleed afresh. Blush, blush, thou lump of foul deformity, for tis thy presence that exhales this blood from cold and empty veins where no blood dwells. Thy deed, inhuman and unnatural, provokes this deluge most unnatural. O oh, 
God, which this blood madest, revenge his death. O earth, which this blood drinkest, revenge his death. Either heaven with lightning strike the murderer dead, or earth gape open wide and eat him quick, as thou dost swallow up this good king's blood, which his hell-governed arm hath butchered. Lady, you know no rules of charity, which renders good for bad, blessings for curses. Villain, thou knowest no law of God nor man, no beast so fierce, but no some touch of pity. But I know none, and therefore am no beast. O oh, wonderful, when devils tell the truth! More wonderful, when angels are so angry! Vouchsafe divine perfection of a woman of these supposed evils to give me leave by circumstance but to acquit myself! Vouchsafe diffused infection of a man for these known evils but to give me leave by circumstance to curse thy cursed self! Fairer than tongue can name thee, let me have some patient leisure to excuse myself! Fowler than heart can think thee, thou canst make no excuse current but to hang thyself. By such despair I should accuse myself. And by despairing shouldst thou stand excused for doing worthy vengeance on thyself, which didst unworthy slaughter upon others. Say that I slew them not. Why then, they are not dead. But dead they are in devilish slave by thee. I did not kill your husband. Why then, he is alive. Nay, he is dead and slain by Edward's hand. In thy foul throat thou liest! Queen Margaret saw thy murderous falchion smoking in his blood, the which thou once didst bend against her breast, but that thy brothers beat aside the point. I was provoked by her slanderous tongue, which laid their guilt upon my guiltless shoulders. Thou wast provoked by thy bloody mind, which never dreamt on aught but butcheries. Didst thou not kill this king? I grant ye. Dost grant me, hedgehog? Then God grant me too, thou mayst be damned for that wicked deed. Oh, he was gentle, mild, and virtuous. The fitter for the king of heaven that hath him. He is in heaven, where thou shalt never come. Let him thank me that hope to send him thither, for he was fitter for that place than earth. And thou unfit for any place but hell. Yes, one place else, if you will hear me name it. Some dungeon. Your bedchamber. Ill respite the chamber where thou liest. So will it, madam, till I lie with you? I hope so. I know so. But, gentle Lady Anne, to leave this keen encounter of our wits and fall somewhat into a slower method, is not the causer of the timeless deaths of these Plantagenets, Henry and Edward, as blameful as the executioner? Thou art the cause, and most accursed <laughs> effect. Your beauty was the cause of that effect. Your beauty, which did haunt me in my sleep to undertake the death of all the world, so I might live one hour in your sweet bosom. If I thought that, I'd tell thee, homicide. These nails should rend that beauty from my cheeks. These eyes could never endure sweet beauty's wreck. You should not blemish it if I stood by. As all the world is cheered by the sun, so I by that. It is my day, my life. Black night or shade thy day, and death thy life. Curse not thyself, fair creature, thou art both. I would I were to be revenged on me. It is a quarrel most unnatural to be revenged on him that loveth you. It is a quarrel just and reasonable to be revenged on him that slew my husband. He that bereft thee, lady, of thy husband, did it to help thee to a better husband. His better doth not breathe upon the earth. He lives that loves thee better than he could. Name him. Plantagenet. Why, that was he. The selfsame name, but one of better nature. Where is he? Here. <coughs> Why dost thou spit at me? Would it were mortal poison for thy sake. Never came poison from so sweet a place. Never hung poison on a fowler toad. Out of my sight thou dost infect my eyes. Thine eyes, sweet lady, have infected mine. Would they were basilisks to strike thee dead. I would they were, that I might die at once, for now they kill me with a living death. Those eyes of thine from mine have drawn salt tears, shamed their aspect with store of childish drops. These eyes that never shed remorseful tear, no, when my father York and Edward wept, to hear the piteous moan that Rutland made when black-faced Clifford shook his sword at him, nor when thy warlike father, like a child, told the sad story of my father's death, and twenty times made pause to sob and weep, 
that all the standers by had wet their cheeks like trees but ashed with rain in that sad time my manly eyes did scorn and humble tear and what these sorrows could not thence exhale thy beauty hath and made them blind with weeping i never sued to friend nor enemy my tongue could never learn sweet smoothing word but now thy beauty is proposed my fee my proud heart sues and prompts my tongue to speak teach not thy lips such scorn for they were made for kissing lady not for such contempt if thy revengeful heart cannot forgive lo here i lend thee this sharp pointed sword which if thou please to hide in this true bosom and let the soul forth that adoreth thee i lay it naked to the deadly stroke and humbly beg the death upon my knee he lays his breast open she offers at it with his sword nay do not pause for i did kill king henry but twas thy beauty that provoked me nay now dispatch twas i that stabbed young edward but twas thy heavenly face that set me on take up the sword again or take up me arise dissembler though i wish thy death i will not be thy executioner then bid me kill myself and i will do it i have already that was in thy rage speak it again and even with a word that hand which for thy love did kill thy love shall for thy love kill a far truer love to both their deaths thou shalt be accessory i would knew thy heart tis figured in my tongue i fear me both are false then never man was true well well put up your sword say then my peace is made that shall you know hereafter but shall i live in hope all men i hope live so vouchsafe to wear this ring to take is not to give look how this ring encompasseth finger even so thy breast encloseth my poor heart wear both of them for both of them are thine and if thy poor devoted supplicant may but beg one favour at thy gracious hand thou dost confirm his happiness for ever what is it that it would please thee leave these sad designs to him that hath more cause to be a mourner and presently repair to crosby place where after i have solemnly interred it chertsey monastery this noble king and wet his grave with my repentant tears i will with all expedient duty see you for divers unknown reasons i beseech you grant me this boon with all my heart and much it joys me too to see you are become so penitent tressel and berkeley go along with me bid me farewell tis more than you deserve but since you teach me how to flatter you imagine i have said farewell already exeunt lady anne tressel and berkeley sirs take up the course towards chertsey noble lord no to whitefriars there attend my coining exeunt all but gloucester was ever woman in this humour wooed was ever woman in this humour won i'll have her but i will not keep her long what i that killed her husband and her father to take her in her heart's extremest hate with curses in her mouth tears in her eyes the bleeding witness of her hatred by having god her conscience and these bars against me and i nothing to back my suit at all but the plain devil and dissembling looks and yet to win her all the world to nothing ha has she forgot already that brave prince edward her lord whom i some three months since stabbed in my angry mood at tewkesbury a sweeter and a lovelier gentleman framed in the prodigality of nature young valiant wise and no doubt right royal the spacious world cannot again afford and will she yet debase her eyes on me that cropped the golden prime of this sweet prince and made her widow to a woeful bed on me whose all not equals edward's moiety on me that halt and am unshapen thus my dukedom to a beggarly denier i do mistake my person all this while upon my life she finds although i cannot myself to be a marvellous proper man 
I'll be at charges for a looking glass and entertain some score or two of tailors to study fashions to adorn my body. Since I am crept in favor with myself, we'll maintain it with some little cost. But first, I'll turn yon fellow in his grave and then return lamenting to my love. Shine out, fair sun, till I have bought a glass, that I may see my shadow as I pass. End of Richard the Third, Act One, Scene Two. A Midsummer Night's Dream, Act Two, Scene One. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, Please visit LibriVox.org. A Midsummer Night's Dream by William Shakespeare. Act Two, Scene One. Demetrius, read by Martin Geeson. Helena, read by Grace Garrett. Enter Demetrius, Helena following him. I love thee not, therefore pursue me not. Where is thy Sander and fair Hermia? the one i'll slay the other slayeth me thou toldst me they were stolen unto this wood and here am i and woed within this wood because i cannot meet my hermia hence get thee gone and follow me no more you draw me you hard-hearted adamant but yet you draw not iron for my heart is as true as steel Leave you your power to draw, and I shall have no power to follow you. Do I entice you? Do I speak you fair? Or rather, do I not in plainest truth tell you I do not, nor I cannot, love you? And even for that, do I love you the more? I am your spaniel, and Demetrius, the more you beat me, I will fawn on you. Use me but as your spaniel. Spurn me, strike me, neglect me, lose me only give me leave unworthy as i am to follow you what worser place can i beg in your love and yet a place of high respect with me than to be used as you use your dog oh, tempt not too much the hatred of my spirit for i am sick when i do look on thee and i am sick when i look not on you you do impeach your modesty too much to leave the city and commit yourself into the hands of one that loves you not to trust the opportunity of night and the ill counsel of a desert place with the rich worth of your virginity your virtue is my privilege for that it is not night when i do see your face therefore i think i am not in the night nor doth this wood lack worlds of company for you and my respects are all the world then how can it be said i am alone when all the world is here to look on me i'll run from thee and hide me in the brakes and leave thee to the mercy of wild beasts the wildest hath not such a heart as you run when you will the story shall be changed apollo flies and daphne holds the chase the dove pursues the griffin the mild hind makes speed to catch the tiger bootless speed when cowardice pursues and valour flies <sighs> i will not stay thy questions let me go or if thou follow me do not believe but i shall do thee mischief in the wood ay in the temple in the town the field you do me mischief fie demetrius your wrongs do set a scandal on my sex we cannot fight for love as men may do we should be wooed, and we're not made to woo. Exit Demetrius. I'll follow thee, and make a heaven of hell, to die upon the hand I love so well. End of A Midsummer Night's Dream Act Two, Scene One Romeo and Juliet Act Two, Scene Two This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Romeo and Juliet by William Shakespeare Act Two, Scene Two Romeo, read by Verity Kendall Juliet! 
read by Charlotte Duckett. He jests at scars that never felt a wound. Juliet appears above at a window. But soft, what light through yonder window breaks? It is the east, and Juliet is the sun. Arise, fair sun, and kill the envious moon, who is already sick and pale with grief, that thou, her maid, art far more fair than she. Be not her maid, since she is envious. Her vestal livery is but sick and green, and none but fools do wear it. Cast it off. It is my lady, oh, it is my love, oh, that she knew she were. She speaks, yet she says nothing. What of that? Her eye discourses. I will answer it. I am too bold. It is not to me she speaks. Two of the fairest stars in all the heaven, having some business, do entreat her eyes to twinkle in their spheres till they return. What if her eyes were there, they in her head? The brightness of her cheek would shame those stars, as light doth a lamp. Her eyes in heaven would through the airy regions stream so bright, that birds would sing and think it were not night. See how she leans her cheek upon her hand. Oh, that I were a glove upon that hand, that I might touch that cheek. I may. She speaks. Oh, speak again, bright angel, for thou art as glorious to this night, being o'er my head as is a winged messenger of heaven. Unto the white upturned wandering eyes of mortals that fall back to gaze on him, when he bestrides the lazy pacing clouds and sails upon the bosom of the air. O oh, Romeo, Romeo, wherefore art thou Romeo? Deny thy father and refuse thy name. Or, if thou wilt not, be but sworn, my love, and I'll no longer be a Capulet. Aside. Shall I hear more, or shall I speak at this? Tis but thy name, it is my enemy. Thou art thyself, though not a Montague. What's a Montague? It is nor hand, nor foot, nor arm, nor face, nor any other part belonging to a man. Oh, be but some other name. What's in a name? That which we call a rose, by any other name, would smell as sweet. So Romeo would, were he not Romeo called, retain that dear perfection which he owes without that title. Romeo doth thy name, and for that name it is no part of thee. Take all myself. I take thee at thy word. Call me but love, and I'll be new baptized. Henceforth I never will be Romeo. What man art thou that thus, for screened in night, so stumblest on my counsel? By a name I know not how to tell thee who I am. My name, dear saint, is hateful to myself, because it is an enemy to thee. Had I it written, I would tear the word. My ears have not yet drunk a hundred words of that tongue's utterance, yet I know the sound. Art thou not Romeo? And am unto you. Neither, fair saint, if either lead to flight. How camest thou hither? Tell me, and wherefore? The orchard walls are high and hard to climb, and the place death, considering who thou art. If any of my kinsmen find thee here. With love's light wings did I o'er perch these walls, for stony limits cannot hold love out. And what love can do that dares love attempt, therefore thy kinsmen are no let to me. If they do see thee, they will murder thee. Alack, there lies more peril in thine eye than twenty of their swords. Look thou but sweet, and I am proof against their enmity. I would not for the world they saw thee here. I have night's cloak to hide me from their sight, and but thou love me, let them find me here. My life were better ended by their hate than death prorogued to wanting of thy love. By whose direction found'st thou this place? By love who first did prompt me to inquire. He lent me counsel, and I lent him eyes. I am no pilot. Yet wert thou as far as that vast shore washed with the farthest sea, I would adventure for such merchandise. Thou knowest the mask of night is on my face, else would a maiden blush repaint my cheek, for that which thou hast heard me speak to-night, fain I would dwell on form, fain, fain deny what I have spoke. But farewell compliment. Dost thou love me? I know thou wilt say I, and I will take thy word. Yet if thou swearest, how may's proof false? Our love is perjuries, they say. Jove laughs. O oh, gentle Romeo, if thou dost love, pronounce it faithfully. Or if thou think'st I am too quickly won, I'll frown and be perverse, and say thee nay, so thou wilt woo, but else not for the world. In truth, fair Montague, I am too fond, and therefore thou mayst think my haviour light. But trust me, gentlemen, I'll prove more true than those that have more cunning to be strange. 
I should have been more strange, I must confess. But that thou overheard, yet I was where, my love's true passion. Therefore pardon me, and do not impute this yielding to light love, which the dark of night hath so discovered. Lady, by yonder blessed moon I swear, that tips with silver all these fruit tree tops. Oh, swear not by the moon, the inconstant moon, that monthly changes her circled orb, lest thy love prove likewise variable. What shall I swear by? Do not swear at all. Or, if thou wilt, swear by thy gracious self, which is the god of my adultery, and I'll believe thee. If my heart's dear, love. Well, do not swear. Although I joy in thee, I have no joy at this contract tonight. It is too rash, too unadvised, too sudden, too like the lightning, which doth cease to be, yet one can say, it's lightning. Sweet good night, this bud of love, by summer's ripening breath, may prove a beauteous flower when we next meet. Good night, good night, a sweet repose and rest, come to thy heart within my breast. Oh, wilt thou leave me so unsatisfied? What satisfaction canst thou have tonight? The exchange of thy love's faithful vow for mine. I gave thee mine before thou did request it, and yet I would it were to give again. Wouldst thou withdraw it? For what purpose, love? To be but frank and give it to thee. And yet I wish but for the thing I have. My bounty is as boundless as the sea, my love is deep. The more I give to thee, the more I have, for both are infinite. Nurse calls within. I hear a noise within. Dear love, adieu. Anon, good nurse. Sweet Montague, be true. Stay but a little. I will come again. Exit above. A blessed, blessed night. I am afeard, bearing in night, all this is but a dream, too flattering sweet to be substantial. Re-enter Juliet, above. Three words, dear Romeo, and good night indeed. If that thy bent of love be honourable, thy proposed marriage, send me word to-morrow by one that I'll procure to come to thee, where and what time thou wilt perform the right, and all my fortunes at thy foot I'll lay, and follow thee, my lord, throughout the world. Madam! I come anon, but if thou meanst not well, I do beseech thee, madam. By and by I come to cease thy suit and leave me to my grief. To morrow I will send. So thrive my soul. A thousand times, good night. Exit above. A thousand times the worse to want thy light. Love goes towards love as schoolboys from their books, but love from love towards school with heavy looks. Retiring. Re-enter Juliet, above. Hist, Romeo, hist! Oh, for a falconer's voice to lure this tassel gentle back again. Bondage is hoarse, and may not speak aloud. Else I would tear the caves where Echo lives, and make her airy tongue more hoarse than mine with repetition of my Romeo's name. It is my soul that calls upon my name. How silver-sweet sound lover's tongues by night, like softest music to attending ears. Romeo! My dear? At what o'clock to-morrow shall I send for thee? At the hour of nine. I will not fail. Tis twenty years till then. I have forgotten why I did call thee back. Let me stand here till thou remember it. I shall forget to have thee stand there, remembering how I love thy company. And I'll still say to have thee still forget, forgetting any other home but this. Tis almost morning. I would have thee gone, yet no further than a wanton's bird, who lets it hop a little from her hand. Like a poor prisoner in the twisted guise, and with the silk thread plucks it back again. So love and jealous of his liberty. I would I were thy bird. Sweet, so would I. Yet I should kill thee with much cherishing. Good night, good night, parting as such sweet sorrow. That I shall say good night till it be morrow. Exit above. Sleep dwell upon mine eyes, peace in thy breast. Would I were sleep and peace, so sweet to rest. Hence will I to my ghostly father's cell, his help to crave, and my dear hap to tell. End of Romeo and Juliet. Act two. Scene two. Much Ado About Nothing. Act four. Scene one. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, Please visit LibriVox.org. Much Ado About Nothing by William Shakespeare. Act Four, Scene One. Beatrice, 
Read by Arielle Lipshaw. Benedict. Read by Valerie Tan. Lady Beatrice, have you wept all this while? Yea, and I will weep a while longer. I will not desire that. You have no reason. I do it freely. Surely I do believe your fair cousin is wronged. Ah, how much might the man deserve of me that would right her? Is there any way to show such friendship? A very even way, but no such friend. May a man do it? It is a man's office, but not yours. I do love nothing in the world so well as you. Is not that strange? As strange as the thing I know not. It were as possible for me to say I loved nothing so well as you. But believe me not, and yet I lie not. I confess nothing, nor I deny nothing. I am sorry for my cousin. By my sword, Beatrice, thou lovest me. Do not swear and eat it. I will swear by it that you love me, and I will make him eat it that says I love not you. Will you not eat your word? With no source that can be devised to it. I protest I love thee. Why then, God forgive me. What offence, sweet Beatrice? You have stayed me in a happy hour. I was about to protest I loved you. And do it with all thy heart. I love you with so much of my heart that none is left to protest. Come, bid me do anything for thee. Kill Claudio? Ha! Not for the wide world. You kill me to deny it. Farewell. Tarry, sweet Beatrice. I am gone, though I am here. There is no love in you. Nay, I pray you, let me go. Beatrice! In faith, I will go. We'll be friends first. You dare easier be friends with me than fight with mine enemy? Is Claudio thine enemy? Is he not approved in the height a villain that hath slandered, scorned, dishonoured my kinswoman? Oh, that I were a man! What, bear her in hand until they come to take hands? And then, with public accusation, uncovered slander, unmitigated rancour, O oh God, that I were a man! I would eat his heart in the market-place! Hear me, Beatrice! Talk with a man out at a window, a proper saying! Nay, but Beatrice— Sweet hero, she is wronged, she is slandered, she is undone! Be Princes and counties, surely a princely testimony, a goodly count, count comfect, a sweet gallant, surely! Oh, that I were a man for his sake! or that I had any friend would be a man for my sake. But manhood is melted into courtesies, valour into compliment, and men are only turned into tongue and trim ones too. He is now as valiant as Hercules that only tells a lie and swears it. I cannot be a man with wishing, therefore I will die a woman with grieving. Tarry, good Beatrice, by this hand I love thee. Use it for my love some other way than swearing by it. Think you in your soul the Count Claudio has wronged Hero? Yea, as sure as I have a thought or a soul. Enough. I am engaged. I will challenge him. I will kiss your hand, and so I leave you. By this hand Claudio shall render me a dear account. As you hear of me, so think of me. Go, comfort your cousin. I must say she is dead. And so, farewell. End of Much Ado About Nothing, Act Four, Scene One. Henry V, Act Five, Scene Two. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Henry V by William Shakespeare, Act Five, Scene Two. King Henry, read by Winston Tharp. Catherine, read by Tiffany Halla Colonna. Alice, read by Elizabeth Clett. Fair Catherine, and most fair, will you vouchsafe to teach a soldier terms such as will enter at a lady's ear and plead his love suit to her gentle heart? Your Majesty shall mock at me. I cannot speak your England. O oh, fair Catherine, if you will love me soundly with your French heart, I will be glad to hear you confess it brokenly with your English tongue. Do you like me, Kate? Pardonnez-moi, I cannot tell what is like me. An angel is like you, Kate, and you are like an angel. Que dit-il? Que je suis semblable à les anges? Oui, vraiment, sauf votre grâce. 
Ainsi dit-il. I said so, dear Catherine, and I must not blush to affirm it. Oh, bon Dieu, les langues des hommes sont pleines de tromperies. What says she, fair one, that the tongues of men are full of deceits? Oui, that the tongues of the man's is be full of deceits. That is the princess. The princess is the better Englishwoman. In faith, Kate, my wooing is fit for thy understanding. I am glad thou canst speak no better English, for if thou couldst, thou wouldst find me such a plain king that thou wouldst think I had sold my farm to buy my crown. I know no ways to mince it in love, but directly to say, I love you. Then if you urge me farther than to say, do you in faith, I wear out my suit. Give me your answer in faith, do, and so clap hands in a bargain. How say you, lady? So votre honneur, me understand well. Marry, if you would put me to verses or to dance for your sake, Kate, why you undid me. For the one I have neither words nor measure, and for the other I have no strength in measure, and yet a reasonable measure in strength. If I could win a lady at leapfrog, or by vaulting into my saddle with my armor on my back, under the correction of bragging be it spoken, I should quickly leap into a wife. Or I might buffet for my love, or bound my horse for her favors, I could lay on like a butcher, and sit like a jack and apes, never off. But before God, Kate, I cannot look greenly, nor gasp out my eloquence, nor I have no cunning in protestation, only downright oaths, which I never use till urged, nor never break for urging. If thou can love a fellow of this temper, Kate, whose face is not worth sunburning, that never looks in his glass for love of anything he sees there, let thine eye be thy cook. I speak to thee, plain soldier. If thou canst love me for this, take me. If not, to say to thee that I shall die is true. But for thy love, by the Lord, no, yet I love thee too. And while thou livest, dear Kate, take a fellow of plain and uncoined constancy, for he perforce must do thee right, because he hath not the gift to woo in other places. For these fellows of infinite tongue that can rhyme themselves into ladies' favors they do always reason themselves out again. What? A speaker is but a praetor. A rhyme is but a ballad. A good leg will fall. A straight back will stoop. A black beard will turn white. A curled pate will grow bald. A fair face will wither. A full eye will wax hollow. But a good heart, Kate, is the sun and the moon. Or rather the sun and not the moon. For it shines bright and never changes. But keeps his course truly. If thou would have such a one, take me, and take me, take a soldier, take a soldier, take a king. And what sayst thou then to my love? Speak, my fair, and fairly, I pray thee. Is it possible that I should love the enemy of France? No, it is not possible you should love the enemy of France, Kate. But in loving me you should love the friend of France, for I love France so well that I will not part with a village of it. I will have it all mine. And, Kate, when France is mine and I am yours, then yours is France and you are mine. I cannot tell what is that. No, Kate. I will tell thee in French, which I am sure will hang upon my tongue like a new married wife about her husband's neck, hardly to be shook off. Chacun sur les possessions de France, à quand vous avez les possessions de moi. Let me see, what then? Saint Denis be my speed. Donc votre est France, et vous êtes mien. It is as easy for me, Kate, to conquer the kingdom as to speak so much more French. I shall never move thee in French unless it be to laugh at me. So votre honneur, le François que vous parlez, il est meilleur que l'anglois lequel je parle. No, faith is not, Kate, but thy speaking of my tongue and I thine most truly falsely must needs be granted to be much at one. But, Kate, dost thou understand thus much English? Canst thou love me? I cannot tell. 
Can any of your neighbors tell, Kate? I'll ask them. Come, I know thou lovest me, and at night when you come into your closet you'll question this gentlewoman about me, and I know, Kate, you will to her dispraise those parts in me that you love with your heart. But, good Kate, mock me mercifully, the rather gentle princess, because I love thee cruelly. If ever thou beest mine, Kate, as I have a saving faith within me, tells me thou shalt, I get thee with scambling, and thou must therefore needs prove a good soldier breeder. Shalt not thou and I, between St. Denis and St. George, compound a boy half French, half English, that shall go to Constantinople and take the Turk by the beard? Shall we not? What sayst thou, my fair flower de luz? I do not know that. No, tis hereafter to know, but now to promise. Do but now promise, Kate, you will endeavor for your French part of such a boy, and for my English moiety take the word of a king and a bachelor. How answer you, la plus belle Catherine du monde, mon trou cher et divine de S? Your majesty have false French enough to deceive the most sage demoiselle that is in France. Now fie upon my false French. By mine honor, in true English, I love thee, Kate. By which honor I dare not swear thou lovest me, yet my blood begins to flatter me that thou dost, notwithstanding the poor and untempering effect of my visage. Now beshrew my father's ambition. He was thinking of civil wars when he got me. Therefore was I created with a stubborn outside, with an aspect of iron, that when I come to woo ladies, I fright them. But in faith, Kate, the elder I wax, the better I shall appear. My comfort is that old age, that ill layer up of beauty, can do no more spoil upon my face. Thou hast me, if thou hast me, at the worst, and thou shalt wear me, if thou wear me, better and better. And therefore tell me, most fair Catherine, will you have me? Put off your maiden blushes, avouch the thoughts of your heart with the looks of an empress. Take me by the hand and say, Harry of England, I am thine. Which word thou shalt no sooner bless mine ear withal, but I will tell thee aloud, England is thine, Ireland is thine, France is thine, and Harry Plantagenet is thine who, though I speak it before his face, if he be not fellow with the best king, thou shalt find the best king of good fellows. Come, your answer in broken music, for thy voice is music, and thy English broken. Therefore, queen of all, Catherine, break thy mind to me in broken English. Wilt thou have me? That is as it shall please the roi, mon père. Nay, it will please him well, Kate. It shall please him, Kate. Then it shall also content me. Upon that I kiss your hand, and I call you my queen. Laissez, Monseigneur, laissez, laissez. Ma foi, je ne veux point que vous abaissiez votre grandeur en baisant la main d'une de votre ségurie indigne serviteur. Excusez-moi, je vous supplie, mon très puissant Seigneur. Then I will kiss your lips, Kate. Les dames et demoiselles, pour être baisées devant leurs noces, il n'est pas la coutume de France. Madame, my interpreter, what says she? That it is not to be the fashion pour des ladies of France. I cannot tell what is baissé en anglais. To kiss. Your majesty entendre better que moi. It is not a fashion for the maids in France to kiss before they are married, would she say? Oui, vraiment. Oh, Kate, nice customs curtsy to great kings. Dear Kate, you and I cannot be confined within the weak list of a country's fashion. We are the makers of manners, Kate, and the liberty that follows our places stops the mouths of all fine faults, as I will do yours, for upholding the nice fashion of your country and denying me a kiss. Therefore, patiently and yielding... You have witchcraft in your lips, Kate. There is more eloquence in a sugar touch of them than in the tongues of the French council. And they should sooner persuade Harry of England than a general petition of monarchs. Here comes your father. End of Henry V, Act Five, Scene Two.
As You Like It, Act Three, Scene Two. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. As You Like It by William Shakespeare. Act Three, Scene Two. Rosalind, read by Elizabeth Clett. Orlando, read by Ariel Lipshaw. I will speak to him like a saucy lackey, and under that habit play the knave with him. <clears throat> Do you hear, Forrester? Very well. What would you? I pray you. What is to clock? You should ask me what time of day. There is no clock in the forest. Then there is no true lover in the forest. Else sighing every minute and groaning every hour would detect the lazy foot of time as well as a clock. And why not the swift foot of time? Had not that been as proper? By no means, sir. Time travels in divers paces with divers persons. I'll tell you who time ambles withal, who time trots withal, who time gallops withal, and who he stands still withal. I prithee, who does he trot withal? Marry, he trots hard with a young maid between the contract of her marriage and the day it is solemnized. If the interim be but a sen-night, time's pace is so hard that it seems the length of seven year. Who ambles time withal? With a priest that lacks Latin, and a rich man that hath not the gout, for the one sleeps easily because he cannot study, and the other lives merrily because he feels no pain, the one lacking the burden of lean and wasteful learning, the other knowing no burden of heavy, tedious penury. These time ambles withal. Who doth he gallop withal? With a thief to the gallows, for though he go as softly as foot can fall, he thinks himself too soon there. Who stays it still withal? With lawyers in the vacation, for they sleep between term and term, and then they perceive not how time moves. Where dwell you, pretty youth? With the shepherdess, my sister here in the skirts of the forest like fringe upon a petticoat. Are you native of this place? As the coney that you see dwell where she is kindled. Your accent is something finer than you could purchase in so removed a dwelling. I have been told so of many. But indeed an old religious uncle of mine taught me to speak, who was in his youth an inland man. One that knew courtship too well, for there he fell in love. I have heard him read many lectures against it, and I thank God, I am not a woman, to be touched with so many giddy offences as he hath generally taxed their whole sex withal. Can you remember any of the principal evils that he laid to the charge of women? There were none principal. They were all like one another as halfpence are, every one fault seeming monstrous till his fellow fault came to match it. I prithee recount some of them. No. I will not cast away my physic but on those that are sick. There is a man haunts the forest that abuses our young plants with carving Rosalind on their barks, hangs odes upon hawthorns and elegies on brambles, all forsooth deifying the name of Rosalind. If I could meet that fancy-monger I would give him some good counsel, for he seems to have the quotidian of love upon him. I am he that is so love-shaked. I pray you tell me your remedy. There is none of my uncle's marks upon you. He taught me how to know a man in love, in which cage of rushes I am sure you are not prisoner. What were his marks? A lean cheek, which you have not, a blue eye and sunken, which you have not, an unquestionable spirit, which you have not, a beard neglected, which you have not, uh, but I pardon you for that, for simply your having in beard is a younger brother's revenue. Then your hose should be ungartered, your bonnet unbanded, your sleeve unbuttoned, your shoe untied, and everything about you demonstrating a careless desolation. But you are no such man. You are rather point device in your accoutrements as loving yourself than seeming the lover of any other. Fair youth, I would I could make thee believe I love. Me believe it? You may as soon make her that you love believe it which I warrant she is apter to do than to confess she does. That is one of the points in the which women still give the lie to their consciences. But in good sooth, are you he that hangs the verses on the trees wherein Rosalind is so admired? I swear to thee, youth, by the white hand of Rosalind, I am that he, that unfortunate he. 
But are you so much in love as your rhymes speak? Neither rhyme nor reason can express how much. Love is merely a madness, and I tell you deserves as well a dark house and a whip as madmen do. And the reason why they are not so punished and cured is that the lunacy is so ordinary that the whippers are in love too. Yet I profess curing it by counsel. Did you ever cure any so? Yes, one, and in this manner. He was to imagine me his love, his mistress, and I sent him every day to woo me, at which time would I, being but a moonish youth, grieve, be effeminate, changeable, longing and liking, proud, fantastical, apish, shallow, inconstant, full of tears, full of smiles, for every passion something, and for no passion truly anything, as boys and women are for the most part cattle of this colour, would now like him, now loathe him, then entertain him, then forswear him, now weep him, then spit at him, that I drave my suitor from his mad humour of love to a living humour of madness, which was to forswear the full stream of the world and to live in a nook merely monastic. And thus I cured him. And this way will I take upon me to wash your liver as clean as a sound sheep's heart, that there shall not be one spot of love in't. I would not be cured, youth. I would cure you, if you would but call me Rosalind, and come every day to my coat and woo me. Now, by the faith of my love, I will. Tell me where it is. Go with me to it, and I'll show it you. And by the way, you shall tell me where in the forest you live. Will you go? With all my heart, good youth. Nay, you must call me Rosalind. Come, sister, will you go? End of As You Like It Act Three, Scene Two Hamlet, Act Three, Scene One This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Hamlet by William Shakespeare Act Three, Scene One Hamlet Read by Martin Giessen Ophelia Read by Grace Garrett Soft you now, the fair Ophelia. Nymph, in thy orisons be all my sins remembered. Good my lord, how does your honour for this many a day? I humbly thank you. Well, well, well. My lord, I have remembrances of yours that I have longed long to re-deliver. I pray you now receive them. No, not I. I never gave you aught. My honoured lord, you know right well you did. And with them, words of so sweet breath composed as made the things more rich. Their perfume lost, take these again. For to the noble mind, rich gifts wax poor when the givers prove unkind. There, my lord. <laughs> Are you honest? My lord? Are you fair? What means your lordship? That if you be honest and fair, your honesty should admit no discourse to your beauty. Could beauty, my lord, have better commerce than with honesty? I truly, for the power of beauty will sooner transform honesty from what it is to a board than the force of honesty can translate beauty into his likeness. This was sometime a paradox but now the time gives it proof i did love you once indeed my lord you made me believe so you should not have believed me for virtue cannot so inoculate our old stock but we shall relish of it i loved you not i was the more deceived oh, get thee to a nunnery why wouldst thou be a breeder of sinners I am myself indifferent honest, but yet I could accuse me of such things, that it were better my mother had not born me. I am very proud, revengeful, ambitious, 
with more offences at my back than i have thoughts to put them in imagination to give them shape or time to act them in what should such fellows as i do crawling between earth and heaven we are arrant knaves all believe none of us <sighs> go thy ways to a nunnery where's your father at home my lord let the doors be shut upon him that he may play the fool nowhere but in his own house farewell oh help him you sweet heavens if thou dost marry i'll give thee this plague for thy dowry be thou as chaste as ice as pure as snow thou shalt not escape calumny get thee to a nunnery go farewell or if thou wilt needs marry marry a fool for wise men know well enough what monsters you make of them to a nunnery go and quickly too farewell o oh, heavenly powers restore him i have heard of your paintings too well enough god has given you one face and you make yourselves another you jig you amble and you lisp and nickname god's creatures and make your wantonness your ignorance go to i'll no more and it hath made me mad i say we will have no more marriages those that are married already all but one shall live the rest shall keep as they are to a nunnery go exit oh what a noble mind is here o'erthrown the courtiers soldiers scholars ay tongue sword the expectancy and rose of the fair state the glass of fashion and the mould of form the observed of all observers quite quite down and i of all ladies most deject and wretched but sucked the honey of his music vows now see that noble and most sovereign reason like sweet bells jangled out of tune and harsh that unmatched form and feature of blown youth blasted with ecstasy oh woe is me to have seen what i have seen see what i see End of Hamlet, Act Three, Scene One. Twelfth Night, Act One, Scene Five. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Twelfth Night by William Shakespeare, Act One, Scene Five. Olivia. Read by Elizabeth Barr. Viola. Read by Grace Garrett. Maria. Read by Elizabeth Clatt. The Honourable Lady of the House. Which is she? Speak to me. I shall answer for her. Your will? <clears throat> Most radiant, exquisite, and unmatchable beauty. I pray you, tell me if this be the Lady of the House, for I never saw her. I would be loath to cast away my speech for besides that it is excellently well penned, I have taken great pains to con it. Good beauties, let me sustain no scorn. I am very comptable, even to the least sinister usage. Whence came you, sir? I can say little more than I have studied, and that questions out of my part. Good gentle one, give me modest assurance if you be the lady of the house, that I may proceed in my speech. <laughs> Are you a comedian? No, my profound heart. And yet— by the very fangs of malice, I swear, I am not that I play. Are you the lady of the house? If I do not usurp myself, I am. Most certain, if you are she, you do usurp yourself. For what is yours to bestow is not yours to reserve. But this is from my commission. I will on with my speech in your praise, and then show you the heart of my message. Come to what is important, and I forgive you the praise. Alas, I took great pains to study it and tis poetical it is the more like to be feigned i pray you keep it in i heard you were saucy at my gates and allowed your approach rather to wonder at you than to hear you 
If you be not mad, be gone. If you have reason, be brief. Tis not that time of moon with me to make one in so skipping a dialogue. Will you hoist sail, sir? Here lies your way. No, good swabber. I am to hold here a little longer. Some mollification for your giant, sweet lady. Tell me your mind. I am a messenger. Sure, you have some hideous matter to deliver when the courtesy of it is so fearful. Speak your office. It alone concerns your ear. I bring no overture of war, no taxation of homage. I hold the olive in my hand. My words are as fun of peace as matter. Yet you began rudely. What are you? What would you? The rudeness that hath appeared in me I have learned from my entertainment. What I am and what I would are as secret as maidenhead. To your ears, divinity. To any others, profanation. Give us the place alone. We will hear this divinity. Exeunt Maria and attendants. Now, sir, what is your text? Most sweet lady. A comfortable doctrine, and much may be said of it. Where lies your text? In Orsino's bosom. In his bosom? In what chapter of his bosom? To answer by the method, in the first of his heart. Oh, I have read it. It is heresy. Have you no more to say? Good madam, let me see your face. Have you any commission from your lord to negotiate with my face? You are now out of your text. But we will draw the curtain and show you the picture. Look you, sir, such a one I was this present. Is't not well done? Unveiling. Excellently done. If God did all. Tis in grain, sir, twill endure wind and weather. Tis beauty truly blent whose red and white nature's own sweet and cunning hand laid on. Lady, you are the cruellest she alive, if you will leave these graces to the grave, and leave the world no copy. Oh, sir, I will not be so hard-hearted. I will give out divers schedules of my beauty. It shall be inventoried in every particle and utensil labelled to my will, as item two lips in different red, item two grey eyes with lids to them, item one neck one chin and so forth were you sent hither to praise me i see what you are you are too proud but if you were the devil you are fair my lord and master loves you oh such love could not be recompensed though you were crowned the non peril of beauty how does he love me with adorations fertile tears with groans that thunder love with sighs of fire your lord does know my mind I cannot love him, yet I suppose him virtuous, know him noble, of great estate, of fresh and stainless youth, in voices well divulged, free, learned, and valiant, and in dimension, in the shape of nature, a gracious person, but yet I cannot love him. He might have took his answer long ago. If I did love you, in my master's flame, with such a suffering, such a deadly life, in your denial I would find no sense. I would not understand it. Why? What would you? Make me a willow cabin at your gate, and call upon my soul within the house. Write loyal cantons of contemned love, and sing them out loud, even in the dead of night. Halloo your name to the reverberate hills, and make the babbling gossip of the air cry out, Olivia! Oh, you should not rest between the elements of air and earth, but you should pity me. You might do much. What is your parentage? Above my fortunes, yet my state is well. I am a gentleman. <laughs> Get you to your lord. I cannot love him. Let him send no more. Uh, unless, perchance, you come to me again. To, to tell me how he takes it. Uh, fare ye well. I thank you for your pains. Spend this for me. I am no feed post, lady. Keep your purse. My master, not myself, lacks recompense. Love make his heart of flint that you shall love, and let your fervour, like my master's, be placed in contempt. Farewell, fair cruelty. Exit. What is your parentage? Above my fortunes, yet my state is well. I am a gentleman. <laughs> I'll be sworn thou art. Thy tongue, thy face, thy limbs, actions, and spirit do give thee fivefold blazon. Not too fast, soft, soft, unless the master were the man. How now? 
Even so quickly may one catch the plague. Methinks I feel this youth's perfections with an invisible and subtle stealth to creep in at mine eyes. Well, let it be. End of Twelfth Night, Act One, Scene Five. Measure for Measure, Act Two, Scene Four. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Measure for Measure by William Shakespeare. Act Two, Scene Four. Angelo, read by Algie Pug. Isabella. Read by Elizabeth Clett. When I would pray and think, I think and pray to several subjects. Heaven hath my empty words, whilst my invention, hearing not my tongue, anchors on Isabel. Heaven in my mouth, as if I did but only chew his name, and in my heart the strong and swelling evil of my conception. The state whereon I studied is like a good thing, being often read grown feared and tedious, yea, my gravity, wherein, let no man hear me, I take pride, could I with boot change for an idle plume which the air beats for vain. O place, O form, how often dost thou with thy case, thy habit, wrench all from fools and tie the wiser souls to thy false seeming? Blood, thou art blood, let's write good angel on the devil's horn. "'Tis not the devil's crest. "'Enter a servant. "'How now? Who's there?' "'One Isabel, a sister, desires access to you. "'Teach her the way.' "'Exit servant.' "'Oh, heavens! Why does my blood thus muster to my heart, "'making it both unable for itself, "'and dispossessing all my other parts of necessary fitness? "'So play the foolish throngs with one that swoons. "'Come all to help him, and so stop the air by which he should revive and even so the general subject to a well-wished king quit their own part and in obsequious fondness crowd to his presence where their untaught love must needs appear a fence enter isabella how now fair maid i am come to know your pleasure that she might know it would much better please me than to demand what tis your brother cannot live even so heaven keep your honour yet may he live a while and it may be as long as you are i yet he must die under your sentence yea when i beseech you that in his reprieve longer or shorter he may be so fitted that his soul sicken not ha fie these filthy vices it were as good to pardon him that hath from nature stolen a man already made as to remit their saucy sweetness that do coin heaven's image in stamps that are forbid tis all as easy falsely to take away a life true made as to put metal in restrained means to make a false one tis set down so in heaven but not in earth say you so then i shall pose you quickly which had you rather that the most just law now took your brother's life or to redeem him give up your body to such sweet uncleanness as she that he hath stained sir believe this i had rather give my body than my soul i talk not of your soul our compelled sins stand more for number than for a compte how say you nay i'll not warrant that for i can speak against the thing i say answer to this i now the voice of the recorded law pronounce a sentence on your brother's life might there not be a charity in sin to save this brother's life please you to do it i'll take it as a peril to my soul it is no sin at all but charity please you to do it at peril of your soul where equal poise of sin and charity that i do beg his life if it be sin heaven let me bear it you granting of my suit if that be sin, I'll make it my morn prayer to have it added to the faults of mine, and nothing of your answer. Nay, but hear me. Your sense pursues not mine. Either you are ignorant, or seem so craftily. And that's not good. Let me be ignorant, and in nothing good, but graciously to know I am no better. 
thus wisdom wishes to appear most bright when it doth tax itself as these black masks proclaim an enshield beauty ten times louder than beauty could displayed but mark me to be received plain i'll speak more gross your brother is to die so and his offence is so as it appears accountant to the law upon that pain true admit no other way to save his life as i subscribe not that nor any other but in the loss of question that you his sister finding yourself desired of such a person whose credit with the judge or own great place could fetch your brother from the manacles of the old building law and that there were no earthly mean to save him but that either you must lay down the treasures of your body to this supposed or else to let him suffer what would you do as much for my poor brother as myself that is were i under the terms of death the impression of keen whips i'd wear as rubies and strip myself to death as to a bed that longing have been sick for ere i'd yield my body up to shame then must your brother die and twere the cheaper way better it were a brother died at once than that a sister by redeeming him should die for ever were not you then as cruel as the sentence you have slandered so ignominy in ransom and free pardon are of two houses lawful mercy is nothing kin to foul redemption you seemed of late to make the law a tyrant and rather prove the slide of your brother a merriment than a vice oh pardon me my lord it oft falls out to have what we would have we speak not what we mean i something do excuse the thing i hate for his advantage that i dearly love we are all frail else let my brother die if not a feodary but only he owe and succeed thy weakness nay women are frail too ay as the glasses where they view themselves which are as easy broke as they make forms women help heaven men their creation mar in profiting by them nay call us ten times frail for we are soft as our complexions are and credulous to false prints i think it well and from this testimony of your own sex since i suppose we are made to be no stronger than faults shall shake our frames let me be bold i do arrest your words be that you are that is a woman if you be more you are none if you be one as you are well expressed by all external warrants show it now by putting on the destined livery i have no tongue but one gentle my lord let me entreat you speak the former language plainly conceive i love you my brother did love juliet and you tell me that he shall die for it he shall not isabel if you give me love i know your virtue hath a license in't which seems a little fouler than it is to pluck on others believe me on mine honour my words express my purpose oh, little honour to be much believed and most pernicious purpose seeming seeming i will proclaim thee angelo look for it sign me a present pardon for my brother or with an outstretched throat i'll tell the world aloud what man thou art who will believe thee isabel my unsoiled name the austereness of my life my vouch against you and my place in the state will so your accusation overweigh that you shall stifle in your own report and smell of calumny i have begun and now i give my sensual race the rein fit thy consent to my sharp appetite lay by all nicety and prolixious blushes that banish what they sue for redeem thy brother by yielding up thy body to my will or else he must not only die the death but thy unkindness shall his death draw out to lingering sufferance answer me to-morrow or by the affection that now guides me most i'll prove a tyrant to him as for you say what you can my false or ways your true exit oh, to whom should i complain did i tell this who would believe me o oh, perilous mouths that bear in them one and the self-same tongue either of condemnation or a proof bidding the law make curtsy to their will hooking both right and wrong to the appetite to follow as it draws all to my brother 
though he hath fallen by prompter of the blood, yet hath he in him such a mind of honour, that had he twenty heads to tender down on twenty bloody blocks, he'd yield them up before his sister should her body stoop to such a bored pollution. Then Isabel, live chaste, and brother die, more than our brother is our chastity. I'll tell him yet of Angelo's request, and fit his mind to death, for his soul's rest. End of Measure for Measure, Act Two, Scene Four. All's Well That Ends Well, Act Four, Scene Two. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. All's Well That Ends Well by William Shakespeare. Act Four, Scene Two. Bertram, read by Martin Giessen. Diana, read by Elizabeth Barr. They told me that your name was Fontibel. No, my good lord, Diana. Titled goddess, and worth it with addition. But, fair soul, in your fine frame hath love no quality. If quick fire of youth light not your mind, you are no maiden but a monument. When you are dead, you should be such a one as you are now, for you are cold and stern and now you should be as your mother was when your sweet self was got she then was honest hmm, so should you be no my mother did but duty such my lord as you owe to your wife ah no more of that i prithee do not strive against my vows i was compelled to her but i love thee by love's own sweet constraint and will for ever do thee all rights of service ay so you serve us till we serve you but when you have our roses you barely leave our thorns to prick ourselves and mock us with our bareness how have i sworn tis not the many oaths that makes the truth but the plain single vow that is vowed true what is not holy that we swear not by, but take the highest to witness? Then pray you, tell me, if I should swear by God's great attributes, I loved you dearly, would you believe my oaths when I did love you ill? This has no holding to swear by him whom I protest to love, that I will work against him. Therefore your oaths are words and poor conditions, but unsealed, at least in my opinion. Change it, change it. Be not so wholly cruel. Love is holy, and my integrity ne'er knew the crafts that you do charge men with. Stand no more off, but give thyself unto my sick desires, who then recover. Say thou art mine, and ever my love as it begins shall so persever. I see that men make ropes in such a scare that we'll forsake ourselves. Give me that ring. Ah, I'll lend it thee, my dear, but have no power to give it from me. Will you not, my lord? It is an honour longing to our house, bequeathed down from many ancestors, which were the greatest obloquy of the world in me to lose mine honours such a ring my chastity is the jewel of our house bequeathed down from many ancestors which were the greatest obloquy in the world and me to lose thus your own proper wisdom brings in the champion honour on my part against your vain assault here take my ring my house mine honour yea my life be thine and i'll be bid by thee when midnight comes, knock at my chamber window. I'll order take, my mother shall not hear. Now will I charge you in the band of truth, when you have conquered my yet maiden bed. Remain there but an hour, nor speak to me. 
my reasons are most strong and you shall know them when back again this ring shall be delivered and on your finger in the night i'll put another ring that what in time proceeds may token to the future our past deeds adieu till then then fail not you have won a wife of me though there my hope be done ah a heaven on earth i have won by wooing thee exit for which live long to thank both heaven and me you may so in the end my mother told me just how he would woo as if she sat in his heart she says all men have the like oaths he had sworn to marry me when his wife's dead therefore i'll lie with him when i am buried since frenchmen are so braid marry that i will i live and die a maid only in this disguise i think no sin to cousin him that would unjustly win end of all's well that ends well act 4 scene 2 antony and cleopatra act 1 scene 3 this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. Antony and Cleopatra by William Shakespeare Act I, Scene Three. Cleopatra, read by Amanda Friday Mark Antony, read by Algy Pug I am sick and sullen. I am sorry to give breathing to my purpose. Help me away, dear Charmian. I shall fall. It cannot be thus long. The sides of nature will not sustain it. Now, my dearest queen. Pray you, stand further from me. What's the matter? I know, by that same eye, there's some good news. What says the married woman? You may go. Would she had never given you leave to come. Let her not say tis I that kept you here. I have no power upon you. Hers you are. The gods best know. Oh, never was their queen so mightily betrayed. Yet at the first I saw the treasons planted. Cleopatra! Why should I think you can be mine and true? Though you in swearing shake the throned gods, Who have been false to Fulvia. Riotous madness, to be entangled with those mouth-made vows Which break themselves in swearing. Most sweet queen! Nay, pray you, seek no colour for your going, But bid farewell, and go. When you sued staying, then was the time for words no going then eternity was in our lips and eyes bliss in our brows bent none our parts so poor but was a race of heaven they are so still or thou the greatest soldier of the world art turned the greatest liar how now lady i would i had thy inches thou shouldst know there were a heart in egypt hear me queen the strong necessity of time commands our services a while, but my full heart remains in use with you. Our Italy shines o'er with civil swords. Sextus Pompeius makes his approaches to the port of Rome. Equality of two domestic powers breeds scrupulous faction. The hated, grown to strength, are newly grown to love. The condemned Pompey, rich in his father's honour, creeps apace into the hearts of such as have not thrived upon the present state, whose numbers threaten. And quietness, grown sick of rest, would purge by any desperate change. My more particular, and that which most with you should safe my going, is Fulvia's death. Though age from folly could not give me freedom, it does from childishness can fulvia die she's dead my queen look here and at thy sovereign leisure read the garboils she awaked at the last best see when and where she died o oh, most false love where be the sacred vials thou shouldst fill with sorrowful water now i see i see in fulvia's death how mine received shall be quarrel no more but be prepared to know the purposes i bear which are or cease as you shall give the advice by the fire that quickens nihilus slime i go from hence thy soldier servant 
making peace or war as thou effectest. Cut my lace, Charmian. Come. But let it be. I am quickly ill, and well, so Antony loves. My precious queen, forbear, and give true evidence to his love which stands an honourable trial. So Fulvia told me. I prithee, turn aside and weep for her, then bid adieu to me, and save the tears belong to Egypt. Good now, play one scene of excellent dissembling, and let it look life perfect honour. You'll heat my blood, no more. You can do better yet, but this is meetly. Now by my sword. And target. Still he mends, but this is not the best. Look, prithee, Charmian, how this Herculean Roman does become the carriage of his chafe. I'll leave you, lady. Courteous lord, one word. Sir, you and I must part, but that's not it. Sir, you and I have loved, but there's not it. That you know well. Something it is I would. Oh, my oblivion is a very Antony, and I am all forgotten. But that your royalty holds idleness your subject, I should take you for idleness itself. Tis sweating labour to bear such idleness so near the heart as Cleopatra this. But, sir, forgive me, since my becomings kill me when they do not eye well to you. Your honour calls you hence. Therefore be deaf to my unpitied folly and all the gods go with you upon your sword sit laurel victory and smooth success be strewed before your feet let us go come our separation so abides and flies that thou residing here goest yet with me and i hence fleeting here remain with thee away end of antony and cleopatra act 1 scene 3 Cymbeline, Act One, Scene Six. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Cymbeline by William Shakespeare, Act One, Scene Six. Iacimo, read by David Lewis Richardson. Imogen, read by Carol Box. Continues well, my lord? His health, beseech you. Well, madam. Is he disposed to mirth? I hope he is. Exceeding pleasant. None a stranger there. So merry and so gamesome, he is called the Briton Reveller. When he was here, he did incline to sadness, and oft times not knowing why. I never saw him sad. There is a Frenchman, his companion, one an eminent monsieur, that it seems much loves a galleon girl at home he furnaces the thick sighs from him whilst the jolly briton your lord i mean laughs from free lungs cries oh can my sides hold to think that man who knows by history report or his own proof what woman is yea what she cannot choose but must be will his free hours languish for a suet bondage will my lord say so ay madam with his eyes in flood with laughter it is a recreation to be by and hear him mock the frenchman but heaven knows some men are much to blame not he i hope not he but yet heaven's bounty towards him might be used more thankfully in himself tis much in you which i count his beyond all talents whilst i am bound to wonder i am bound to pity too what do you pity sir two creatures heartily am i one sir you look on me. What wreck discern you in me deserves your pity? Lamentable. What, to hide me from the radiant sun and solace in the dungeon by a snuff? I pray you, sir, deliver with more openness your answers to my demands. Why do you pity me? That others do. I was about to say, enjoy your... But it is an office of the gods to venge it, not mine to speak on it. You do seem to know something of me, or what concerns me. Pray you, since doubting things go ill often hurts more than to be sure they do, for certainties either are past remedies, or timely knowing. The remedy, then born, discover to me what both you spur and stop. 
had I this cheek to bathe my lips upon, this hand whose touch, whose every touch, would force the feeler's soul to the oath of loyalty, this object which takes prisoner the wild motion of mine eye, fixing it only here. Should I, damned then, slaver with lips as common as the stairs that mount the capital, join gripes with hands made hard with hourly falsehood, falsehood as with labour, then by peeping in an eye, base and unlustrous as the smoky light that's fed with stinking tallow, it were fit that all the plagues of hell should at one time encounter such revolt. My lord, I fear, has forgot Britain. And himself. Not I, inclined to this intelligence, pronounce this beggary of his change. But tis your graces, that from my mutest conscience to my tongue, charms this report out. Let me hear no more. O oh, dearest soul, your cause doth strike my heart with pity that doth make me sick. A lady so fair and fastened to an empery would make the greatest king double, to be partnered with tomboys hired with that self-exhibition which your own coffers yield, with diseased ventures that play with all infirmities for gold which rottenness can lend nature. Such boiled stuff as well might poison poison. Be revenged, or she that bore you was no queen, and you recoil from your great stock. Revenged! How should I be revenged, if this be true, as I have such a heart that both mine ears must not in haste abuse? If it be true, how should I be revenged? Should he make me live like Diana's priest betwixt cold sheets, whilst he is vaulting variable ramps in your despite upon your purse? Revenge it. I dedicate myself to your sweet pleasure, more noble than that renegade to your bed and will continue fast to your affection, still close as sure. What hope, Isanio? Let me, my service, tender on your lips. Away! I do condemn mine ears that have so long attended thee. If thou wert honourable, thou wouldst have told this tale for virtue, not for such an end thou seek'st, as base as strange. Thou wrong'st a gentleman, who is as far from thy report as thou from honour, and solicit'st here a lady that disdains thee and the devil alike. What ho, Pisanio! The king my father shall be made acquainted of thy assault, if he shall think it fit. A saucy stranger in his court to mart as in a Romish stew, and to expound his beastly mind to us. He hath a court he little cares for, and a daughter who he not respects at all. What ho, Pisanio! O oh, happy Leonatus! I may say the credit that thy lady hath of thee deserves thy trust, and thy most perfect goodness her assured credit. Blessed live you long, a lady to the worthiest sir that ever country called his, and you his mistress, only for the most worthiest fit. Give me your pardon. I have spoke this to know if your affiance were deeply rooted and shall make your lord that which he is new o'er and he is one the truest mannered such a holy witch that he enchants societies into him half all men's hearts are his you make amends he sits mongst men like a descended god he hath a kind of honour sets him off more than a mortal seeming be not angry most mighty princess that i have adventured to try your taking a false report which hath honoured with confirmation your great judgment in the election of a sir so rare, which you know cannot err, the love I bear him made me to fan you thus. But the gods made you, unlike all others, chaffless. Pray your pardon. All's well, sir. Take my power i' the court for yours. My humble thanks. I had almost forgot to entreat your grace, but in a small request, and yet of moment too, for it concerns your lord, myself and other noble friends are partners in the business pray what is t some dozen romans of us and your lord the best feather of our wing have mingled sums to buy a present for the emperor which i the factor for the rest have done in france tis plate of rare device and jewels of rich and exquisite form their value's great and i am something curious being strange to have them in safe stowage may it please you to take them in protection willingly and pawn mine honour for their safety. Since my lord hath interest in them, 
I will keep them in my bedchamber. They are in a trunk, attended by my men. I will make bold to send them to you. Only for this night I must aboard tomorrow. Oh, no, no. Yes, I beseech, or I shall short my word by lengthening my return. From Gallia I crossed the seas on purpose and on promise to see your grace. I thank you for your pains, but not away to-morrow. Oh, I must, madam. Therefore I shall beseech you, if you please, to greet your lord with writing. Do it to-night. I have outstood my time, which is material to the tender of our present. I will write. Send your trunk to me. It shall safe be kept, and truly yielded you. You're very welcome. End of Cymbeline, Act One, Scene Six. The Winter's Tale, Act Four, Scene Four. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Winter's Tale by William Shakespeare, Act Four. Scene four. Florizel, read by Martin Geeson. Perdita, read by Amanda Friday. These your unusual weeds to each part of you do give a life. No shepherdess, but Flora peering in April's front. This your sheep shearing is as a meeting of the petty gods, and you the queen on't sir my gracious lord to chide at your extremes it not becomes me oh pardon that i name them your high self the gracious marco the land you have obscured with a swain's wearing and me poor lowly maid most goddess-like pranked up but that our feasts in every mess have folly and the feeders digest it with a custom i should blush to see you so attired sworn i think to show myself a glass i bless the time when my good falcon made her flight across thy father's ground now jove affords you cause to me the difference forges dread your greatness hath not been used to fear even now i tremble to think your father by some accident should pass this way as you did oh the fates how would he look to see his work so noble vilely bound up what would he say or how should I, in these my borrowed flaunts, behold the sternness of his presence? Apprehend nothing but jollity. The gods themselves, humbling their deities to love, have taken the shapes of beasts upon them. Jupiter became a bull and bellowed. The green Neptune a ram and bleated. And the fire-robed god, golden Apollo, a poor humble swain as i seem now their transformations were never for a piece of beauty rarer nor in a way so chaste since my desires run not before mine honour nor my lusts burn hotter than my faith oh but sir your resolution cannot hold when tis opposed as it must be by the power of the king one of these two must be necessities which then will speak that you must change this purpose or i my life thou dearest perdita with these forced thoughts i prithee darken not the mirth of the feast or i'll be thine my fair or not my father's for i cannot be mine own nor anything to any if i be not thine to this i am most constant though destiny say no be merry gentle strangle such thoughts as these with anything that you behold the while your guests are coming lift up your countenance as it were the day of celebration of that nuptial which we two have sworn shall come o lady fortune stand you auspicious see your guests approach address yourself to entertain them sprightly and let's be red with mirth end of the winter's tale act four scene four 
The Tempest, Act Three, Scene One. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Tempest by William Shakespeare, Act Three, Scene One. Ferdinand, read by Elizabeth Clatt. Miranda, read by Ariel Lipshaw. Prospero, read by Algy Pug. Enter Ferdinand bearing a log. Oh, there be some sports are painful, and their labour delight in them sets off. Some kinds of baseness are nobly undergone, and most poor matters point to rich ends. This my mean task would be as heavy to me as odious, but the mistress which I serve quickens what's dead, and makes my labours pleasures. Oh, she is ten times more gentle than her father's crabbed, and he's composed of harshness. I must remove some thousands of these logs and pile them up upon a sore injunction. My sweet mistress weeps when she sees me work, and says, such baseness had never like executor. I forget, but these sweet thoughts do even refresh my labours, most busy lest when I do it. Enter Miranda, and Prospero at a distance, unseen. Alas, now, pray you, work not so hard. I would the lightning had burnt up those logs that you were enjoined to pile. Pray, set it down and rest you. When this burns, twill weep for having wearied you. My father is hard at study. Pray now, rest yourself. He's safe for these three hours. Oh, most dear mistress, the sun will set before I shall discharge what I must strive to do. If you'll sit down, I'll bear your logs the while. Pray, give me that. I'll carry it to the pile. No, precious creature. I had rather crack my sinews, break my back, than you should such dishonour undergo while I sit lazy by. It would become me as well as it does you, and I should do it with much more ease, for my good will is to it, and yours it is against. Poor worm, thou art infected. This visitation shows it. You look wearily. No, noble mistress, tis fresh morning with me when you are by at night. I do beseech you, chiefly that I might set it in my prayers. What is your name? Miranda. Oh, my father, I have broke your hest to say so. Admired Miranda. Indeed, the top of admiration. Worth what's dearest to the world. Full many a lady I have eyed with best regard, and many a time the harmony of their tongues hath into bondage brought my too diligent ear. For several virtues have I liked several women. Never any with so full soul, but some defect in her did quarrel with the noblest grace she owed, and put it to the foil. But you, oh, you, so perfect and so peerless, are created of every creature's best. I do not know one of my sex. No woman's face remember, save from my glass, mine own. Nor have I seen more that I may call men than you, good friend, and my dear father. How features are abroad I am skillless of, but by my modesty, the jewel in my dower, I would not wish any companion in the world but you, nor can imagination form a shape besides yourself to like of. But I prattle something too wildly, and my father's precepts I therein do forget. I am in my condition a prince, Miranda. I do think a king. I would not so. And would no more endure this wooden slavery than to suffer the flesh-fly blow my mouth. Hear my soul speak. The very instant that I saw you did my heart fly to your service. There resides to make me slave to it. And for your sake am I this patient log-man. Do you? Love me? O oh, heaven! O oh, earth! 
bear witness to this sound, and crown what I profess with kind event if I speak true. If hollowly, invert what best is boded me to mischief. I beyond all limit of what else in the world do love, prize, honour you. I am a fool to weep at what I am glad of. Fair encounter of the two most rare affections. Heavens rain grace on that which breeds between them. Wherefore weep you? Of mine unworthiness, that dare not offer what I desire to give, and much less take what I shall die to want. But this is trifling, and all the more it seeks to hide itself, the bigger bulk it shows. Hence, bashful cunning, and prompt me, plain and holy innocence. I am your wife if you will marry me. If not, I'll die your maid. To be your fellow you may deny me, but I'll be your servant, whether you will or no. My mistress, dearest, and I thus humble ever. My husband, then. I, with a heart as willing as bondage heir of freedom. Here's my hand. And mine, with my heart in it. And now farewell, till half an hour hence. A thousand, thousand. Exeunt Ferdinand and Miranda, severally. So glad of this as they, I cannot be. You are surprised with all. But my rejoicing at nothing can be more. I'll to my book, for yet ere supper time must I perform much business appertaining. End of the Tempest, Act Three, Scene One.